Now, the origins of Project Elise can be situated in the work of a number of different academics who for a long time have realised the potential of investigating uh, the pillar of Elise to answer a, a number of important research questions. The project was originally started in order to primarily explore the medieval history of the mound, particularly looking at the, the, um, the pillar on the top of the mound, and also to explore some geophysical anomalies that were being picked up in this field uh, by Durham University uh, quite a number of years ago. They were showing a whole series of different circular and rectilinear enclosures in the field, and one of the, the key aims was to set the pillar within the context of these other features. Last year, we were our remit was only to reveal the archaeology, not to dig into it. Last year we set a few uh, trenches over the, the mound in order to explore uh, you know, the composition of the mound, of what it actually was, to confirm whether we were actually dealing with a prehistoric site or not. And that confirmed the fact that this is what we were dealing with, that we were dealing with a curbed ken of some description, that it was quite large, so we had a large curb ken with another monument sort of built on the top of it, but no real idea at the chronology of, you know, we know which came first and which came later, but we didn't know the, the period between of which uh, this sort of sequence, there's no, no dating for this sequence in itself. The, the pillar of Veliseg, um is sited on top of this, uh, what we think is an early Bronze Age cairn, and in fact, it's um, sited in the valley of the Nant Egrusig, and this is in a very strategic position. The cairn itself is on the end of um, a ridge, so in a very prominent location. And then the um, monument is at the entrance to the pass known as the Horseshoe Pass or Bulkeroya Nant, which leads from the River Dee down in the Vale of Langotlan up northwards, um, right into the northern part of Denbyshire. So this was a street strategic point for the Kingdom of Powys in the 9th century. Uh, it's in a very unusual location for uh, a Ken, in fact it's in the valley bottom. You know, most of uh, these Bronze Age burial monuments of this date are found high up, they're found upon ridges, they're found upon the tops of hills, sort of uh, in these sort of valleys, not actually in the valley bottom. So it's a very unusual uh, setting for one. Although we are actually, you know, we're not that high, but coming from Thagoslin up the valley, it would have sort of been silhouetted on this sort of hilltop. Um, in the early medieval period, we have resumed interest in this site. And then in the um, early 9th century, the Pillar of Eliseg um, which was originally a cross, which you can see here, was erected on top of this uh, burial mound, probably to make it look more, um, uh, well, to have more impact on the surrounding landscape, but also perhaps to have a link with um, previous uh, users of this monument for burial. There may have been a deliberate claiming of ancestry through that link to an ancient monument. And that's reflected very much in the text itself, a text that talks about the kings of powers and their descent um, from ancient heroes and, and legendary figures. Edward Floyd recorded um, a lengthy inscription which is about um, the rulers of powers. Um, it names uh, Kungen, um, the last early medieval ruler of Paris who died in Rome in 854 as the, as the person who put this pillar up, um, thereby more or less dating the monument. And it records the deeds of his great-grandfather, Eliseg, um, who is supposed to have um, uh, thrown out the Anglo-Saxons. We know that in the 18th century they were back re-erecting the cross on or the cross shaft on top of the mound. So at that stage they were messing around and augmenting the, the monument as well. So we, we, we suspect that some of the way the mound appears today is not prehistoric at all, but is, is based on um, 18th century um, activity. So we're digging into the area which is already disturbed, it seems, by antiquarian disturbance 
to understand what they did to the monument as well as its earliest origin and its subsequent evolution. In um, 1773, the local landowner um, came back here and he decided to re-erect the monument in its space on the top of the mound. And in order to do this, um, he decided, well, he, he conducted an excavation. The, the main purpose of this year was to find that antiquarian trench, to excavate the antiquarian trench and look for material culture which uh, maybe could date the mound but also material culture which could tell us something about the, uh, how the antiquarians may have dug in the mound, what they may have found. So far we've just started cleaning back. It's the first day, the turf has been removed off the trench and we've started to clean back down to the terraform that was put there, protecting the archaeology at the end of last year's excavations. It's been a bit of a mixed day. We've had people off sick, we've had people who are sick, we've had problems with the trench, we've had uh, three days basically of trying to cut back through the work that Cadu did to consolidate the monument following last year's excavations. Now it was very good, they're taking very seriously the conservation of the mound and making sure that they build up what um, an area that had been worn away by animals and by visitors to the monument and perhaps the area that had been affected by the antiquarian disturbance. And so they, they made the rat mound nice and round. And unfortunately that means it's given us an extra foot of material to dig back through to get to where we got to last year. The, the layer we're down onto is a terum, which is a semi-permeable membrane, which has been put down to mark the extent of last year's excavations. And as you can see, we're now down uh, that, that surface, which shows where, where we're up to. Uh, there's a lot of material being moved uh, and we're about in the process now of actually pulling it back to reveal the, the stones which were cleaned up last year and drawn last year to uh, fix yeah. excavated last season 2010 um, to about here was the backfill so I've taken it down exposed the section sides here and behind me and then we uh, we overshot the trench by about a foot um, so what I also did was uncover through archaeological excavation the rest of the trench that you see now so from about here onwards um, you can see the section sides and what became apparent very quickly is this orangey colour that you have here is, is highly compact um, they're using it to compact in between the, uh, the big stones that face the cairn and I think it's probably holding it in place as well because it was like um, hacking out cement um, we've had a few finds, we had like a, a bronze button it looked quite you know, 19th, 18th century, that kind of thing um, so the intention is now, once this is finished, taking out the plough soil just at the bottom here to expose the rest of this orangey um, deposit and then we'll record the area. Okay, so what I'm doing is trying to get back down to the same level as Joe there. So going on the face of this kerb and hoping the same stuff over there. Coming across similar material that she described as the packing stuff that's quite hard to trowel through. Um, so we're going to be clearing sections so then we can get a really good idea of how 
this is structured. We're presuming this is packing material to hold the curb in place, but it might be full from on the can. So we're trying to figure out what's going on. And then in the same way that Joe will, will record it, photograph it through context sheets and um, establish how it's actually, what, what all this material is. Okay, so it's Thursday, the 8th of September, this is day five, I think, of the project. Uh, what we're doing today is we're continuing on from yesterday. The weather's been, well, it's okay at the moment. Yesterday was a bit of rain. Uh, continuing on what we're doing yesterday, so we're cleaning up the cairn, ready to do some final bit of planning on it before we start looking into the antiquarian trench. Uh, we're hoping to start removing stone, certainly by lunchtime today. Uh, other things we're doing is we're doing some recording. Recording is very important in archaeology because there's often an emphasis on uh, you know, digging holes in the ground. But we have to remember that excavation is inherently uh, destructive. You're actually destroying the thing you're actually trying to discover, if you like. So recording, taking photographs, drawing plans, uh, writing uh, context sheets, descriptions of different things that we encounter, we'll be carrying out sort of later today. Uh, and the other thing we're doing is we're continuing a trench that we dug last year, uh, opening up an old trench in order to identify a ditch. We are removing uh, backfill that went in last year, getting back down to where we were, back down to the natural, through, well, through the plough soil, down to the natural, it's, it's packed dry and and gritty this bit. Um, we've got to do that back to here because this is the trench. Are we looking for the, the ditch? The ditch! <laughs> the, the Gary's ditch! <laughs> a possible ditch, I should say, which may be running around the monument. And this is quite important because it could have um, material culture within that which could actually date uh, the monument itself. So that's what we've got planned for, for today. We'll just have to see how the day goes and how much we can get that to get how much we actually get done. We don't have really change interpretations. What we actually have is the, the monument itself is this, uh, you can see the stone behind us, and we've got this very impressive curb, which is not particularly unusual for a, a, a what's called a curbed cairn. It's a, it's a monument which dates from about 2000 BC, but it's incredibly well preserved. Uh, the curb is all upstanding, you can see the stones behind it. There's a number of questions about this. One is there's material at the front of the curb which is actually holding the whole thing in place. Now, what we don't know is whether this material has been intentionally placed there in the past, at some point in the past, possibly in prehistory, whether it's material which has fallen off the mound, which seems unlikely because it's packed very tightly against it, or whether it's material that is a result of ploughing. We know that the site has been ploughed very close to the monument, uh, in the recent no past and probably in the yeah, distant past as well, whether this is just cast over water material, water stone that people have removed from the plough soil and thrown against the monument. Just, what yeah. we're doing here today is creating a photographic tower using scaffolding and planks. The idea is that the photographer or videoer from this platform will be able to have a view of the excavations equivalent to that of a bird of prey. From his eyrie, Gary, for instance, will be able to scrutinise in detail every centimetre of the archaeological excavations using his lens. We're trying to reset up this uh, um, this photo tower have it, having it, it it was blown down two days ago. The wind has died so we are trying to put it up again. It has taken us about an hour and a half to put it up before but now we're seasoned veterans We've managed to get it up in, uh, so to speak, in only 10 minutes. And uh, up it is. And the wind hasn't blown it down yet because uh, I'm still up here. So what I'm gonna do is take some general shots of excavation work in progress that allow us to understand 
where we are and then um, we'll probably take down the top parts of the, um, the, the tower and take some pictures at the end of day when we've cleaned up. Um, we can't leave it up all day because we fear that it might get blown down. So we'll take down the, the top bits and then we'll try again. Later on. That was utterly boring. Never mind. Okay, here we go. The epitome of stability. <laughs> Lewis, Lewis, how do you answer the allegations? What allegations? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's uh, now it's Monday uh, of week two of the, of the excavations at Pillar of Lysig. Uh, our interpretations of the monument have changed slightly. Uh, there's been a few surprises. Uh, the main thing is that as we've been removing material from the cairn itself, it's quite clear that there's two separate phases of build-up of stone cairn material on the monument. Now, it's possible that this uh, episode of the building of the cairn is not prehistoric. It could uh, post-date the construction of the first primary phase of the site. So, just to sort of recap on what we've got. So, we start off with a, a platform cairn, or a curbed cairn. So this is defined by a whole series of large blocks, these blocks made of uh, different types of stone, which demarcate uh, this fairly large uh, area. And then on top of this, uh, of this cairn, we have a stone, a smaller stone uh, mound, if you like, itself, onto which the, uh, the Pillar of Elisig is, is, is uh, constructed on the top of this. And the original primary phase of the monument doesn't seem to be of stone construction. We have the curbs are on the outside, but then the fill, if you like, the, the, the material which has been packed in behind these curbs seems to be largely of soil, of a very clay style material with smaller stones embedded within it. So the first phase of the monument, this ken, the term ken meaning sort of a pile of stones, isn't strictly speaking a ken. It's more of a, a stone and earthen monument. And then this later phase, this uh, capping of stones on the top, again, it appears to have two phases to it. Uh, one which is made up of uh, this homogenous area of uh, it's like a silt stone, like a sedimentary stone. And then a second phase of uh, <laughs> build-up of care material, which is of a mixture of different types of stone more rounded and shapes, a variety of different shapes and a variety of different stone sources. And that stone in particular is probably derived from an old river terrace and there's a whole series of river terraces in the valley here leading down to the, where the river is today. So an old river terrace being used to construct that final capping of the monument. And so there's clear distinction between this angular material and this uh, rounded material. And, of course, on top of that, we have the construction of the pillar. So we have these four phases, if you like, if we include the pillar as one construction, as one uh, phase of this. Uh, and these last two stages could be associated with the erection of a pillar rather than an extension of the prehistoric monument. So we're dealing with something that's actually potentially quite complex. And uh, today we're removing the Ken material to expose the, uh, the primary phase beneath it onto which we're going to explore over the next few days. Pretty great hole. Oh, some, some rock tip. So today me and Joe have been looking at this area behind the curb which was distinctly different due to larger stones which didn't really seem to fit with what we were getting from a lot of the, re from the rest of the cairn. So we also noticed that it, it seemed to form a top and side type um, structure almost. See there's this outline around here which is potentially of interest and the three stones sat in the middle of it. When we took them off we've cleaned it down, found larger stones again underneath but there is this distinct shape coming out which is very, this area seems very different to the rest. And we're digging, digging a hole. What we're doing is we're excavating out from the mound in search of, of what might be a ditch around the monument that was clear on the geophysics but we didn't find last year. Now the reason we didn't find it last year is probably because it's not there. But the other possibility is it's, it's in somewhere we didn't dig. 
And so we're extending the trench out from the mound in the hope that we can find it there. At the moment, nothing's coming up. It could be because there's nothing there, but it could be because we can't see it. Project Elise Egg, day 11, 2011. Today we see jubilance, we see joy in the trenches for three discrete reasons. The first reason is that our tower can rise again for photography purposes given that the wind has died down. Second, because CADU, the people who manage and own the site, have been to inspect us and they gave us great words of support and wisdom about our endeavours. They told us we had done well, they told us that we had done better than well and that they were pleased with our progress. But thirdly and most importantly, we are jubilant because of the state of play, where we got with the archaeology. Now, we have excavated through the above at the top layer of antiquarian disturbance that Gary discussed with you on the day nine blog and we have excavated in two areas either side of this metre wide bulk down into the underlying cairn material and now both sides we're on into this mixture of stones and uh, earth that form the, we think the primary phase of the prehistoric monuments construction. Now with agreement from Cadu, we're going to excavate a part into that and to see where, what lies beneath, see what lurks at the very base of this mound. Tell me when I can try and remove it and what? put it what somewhere nicer for it. What are we looking at? Yeah. Get that diseased creature off my yeah, side. Yeah, I'm not sure they're safe to touch that. So that'd be all right. Exomatosis? No, it's clean eyes, it's all right. Gary, we've got a rabbit in the trench. It's only a babby. Don't touch it. That's what? fine, it depends it's going to go to. It'll, be, it'll need to go down there, doesn't it, rather than up the road. It's only a babby. We shouldn't bite it and stop frothing at the mouth. Alright. Oh, Not a rabid rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's clean eyes. It's like a sampress. <laughs> if she starts frothing at the mouth next week, Gary, during the reduction week, you know. It's fine. She'll be gone, just pick it up. Can I get a photograph? Little oh. babby. He's got sand in his eyes oh. now. So we're we're basically coming towards the end of the excavations now, and we've gone systematically and carefully recording as we go, sieving all the soil from the mound through um, what is approaching on the far side of the monument, almost a metre of cairn material. We're doing this systematic, slow peeling back of the monument in order that we don't miss any subtle, small features that could be within the cairn material that could provide dating evidence. Um, yesterday, Katie found an area of um, a dark patch which had uh, charcoal inclusions in it. Um, so while the rest of the excavation was going on, we uh, protected it with a couple of kneeling mats. Then today we cleaned it up, and it did look like some sort of feature. Um, so we cleaned it up, photographed it, and then using a leaf trowel and a sample bag, we've been doing a 100% sample of the area. Um, after a little bit of a, um, a ferret round, as it were, we realised that it was potentially going on a little bit further, so we decided to clean back around the area to see if we can actually find a cook for the feature. And then, if not, it may just be a little deposit within the, uh, this larger matrix context. Um, so we're just investigating that at the moment. We have, after today, only two more days of work. One day of recording and finishing off any excavation, and then on Saturday morning we'll be starting the backfilling, returning the monument to an integral form, back to the way in which we found it. We've done a colossal amount of work. We worked slowly, systematically, carefully. We've recorded as we've gone, and we try to make sure that we haven't missed any subtle, small features like kisses or um, little scoops that could have been evidence of secondary burials because often these cairns are not one phase monuments, they have burial activity in multiple phases so we've had to hold off uh, a, ran 
a raging scramble for the finish, ripping up stones. We kept a calm pace. Okay, this area here where I'm working at the moment has been hidden from view because we had a large blue um, kind of slate stone that's been sat in section for about a week. Um, Gary's removed that and started a bit of a clean back um, and very quickly he found a piece of what looks like cremated bone. Um, so what I've then done is started to just clean the section back and as we've done so we've been beginning to reveal what look like stones lining this area of soil which is very unusual in this area because it's been full of stones. Um, we have um, coming down at tapering at the bottom and then what looks like small stones laid almost as a bed one on top of the other but they're a lot smaller. And then we also have this capping stone here which seems to sit directly above the feature that we have. Um, just underneath the capital stones, there's been void, and as I was cleaning that, um, the, the tiny, tiny uh, seeds, I think they are probably, rather than beads, um, popped out a couple of them, and as I continued to clean, I eventually had about 20, and a couple of clumps where there may be three or four in there, so we've been cleaning that back, that's potentially very interesting because they look charred as well, so there's some sort of human activity involved rather than just being deposited by natural, uh, natural actions. So as I clean this back, I'm just going to clean up here so we can understand the relationship with the rest of the cairn. Um, and then it'll be photographed, drawn in section, and then the capping stone will be uh, returned to its position. It must be said that because of our slow pace and our careful archaeological method, we're not in a position where we've completely excavated the area we intended. And this is always the part of an archaeological excavation. There are so many factors to take into account. We cannot predict exactly how long it'll take to do the work. It looks like we're going to have to make a decision of whether we've got enough outstanding questions to come back, to come back here maybe next year for a season three. Um, investigation of the mound. Maybe not opening every area we've opened this year, but open, opening selected parts and perhaps opening other segments of the mound in order to ask further questions. We have answered some of our questions. We've got a multi-phase monument, we've got a clear understanding um, of the sequence of activity within the area we've opened, but we're lacking a lot of, at the moment, a lot of the conclusive dating evidence from artefacts that would allow us to understand um, the, the precise phases of each of the these layers. This morning we are backfilling in uh, certain areas of the site and other areas we are section drawing us to get uh, a good insight into what is occurring in the rest of the, uh, the cairn that we, we can't dig into at this time and in other parts we are tidying them here and so when people come in for the open day we have, we have uh, a lot more to show them. I was excavating, um, just taking the, the loose out of this uh, area here because of the nature of, the, of these stones here we thought it, that it might be uh, a kiss and just oh, yeah. gently moving the soil away like that and, the, and a piece of white, uh, not, not white, but creamy bone. So this is the piece of bone uh, that was found in that potential kist there and there seem to be two uh, cut marks on it there. You can see it's quite thin and it's got a curve, possibly uh, a skull. A skull. Uh, we're uh, finishing the photography really and so as a final thing we're taking down the photographic tower. We had Adam Stanford of Aerial Cam, um, well-known archaeological photographer, professional, who came yesterday and did some aerial views with his long pole um, from the site. After all, it's important to say that we've been here on this site longer than anybody else has been for any single duration. We've been here every day for two weeks and that gives you a sense of place. It gives you a sort of a, 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 a connection to the, the, the landscape, the weather, the changing weather patterns and how the monument interacts with that. And so it's important to try and capture something of that atmosphere um, while we're here using the video and using the, uh, the, the still cameras. Let me lift it. So I'm just going to get the level to the bottom. Shall I come down there?
It would have been fun there. Yeah. Overall, um, I think it's been a, 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 a dig of a dig of substantial endeavour. I think that's the that's what I would sum, sum it up as a dig of substantial endeavour. We've had two weeks which have been very successful, really. Um, after rather a slow start, we've fulfilled the majority of the remits of the excavation for this year. We did encounter uh, areas of of, of uh, Areas of disturbance within the, the upper can of the of the monument, and this is probably as a result of uh, antiquarian disturbance. We've um, uh, excavated the antiquarian um, scoop, uh, which um, is dated not only by its kind of form, but also by the, us finding post-medieval pottery in it. Though there is a lot of tree hollows in the mound itself, we can't rule out that much of that disturbance is caused by, by trees because we do know that trees were growing on the mound certainly in the, the 19th, late 19th and early 20th century. We've uncovered um, the Bronze Age cairn, some of which is quite disturbed by tree roots and so forth. We haven't found any prehistoric uh, material culture as such, although we have hints of a cremated bone coming out from the bottom of, of particularly on the bottom of the trench beside in inside of the curb which would be uh very highly suggestive of burials taking place uh, in that area and this would be quite typical for bronze age uh, monuments of this type and if we come back next year or when we come back next year i would suspect that we will find burials uh, in the lower sort of sections of the monument Higher up in the monument, in this sort of upper sort of cairn, if you like, we have found this uh, the tail end or the very end of a, a, a long kist, or what we're assuming is a long kist. Uh, it's appearing in our section, it's disappearing out into the unexcavated monument. Again, next year we're going to come back and excavate this, uh, which is about, should be a very exciting, uh, potentially very exciting result to come from that. So it's been a very successful year, uh, all in all. Now, the reason why um, we are deciding to do a daily video blog for Project Elite is we're acutely aware that any archaeological project taking place in a rural area um, will only have a small number of visitors. The other side of it is to add and augment our understanding of the, the recording process, the context recording. What we want to do is to have the, the video recording, the interpretations by the archaeologist, physically record the physical process of excavation and what and the relationship between the two and it's not a straightforward thing is it? it's a complicated oh, no. process doing the video recording so it's not only the equipment but it's someone who knows how to edit it afterwards but also what to record in, in the field yeah exactly and i think that's one of the major problems because they often either have um, 
um, a person who's very good at the media or an archaeologist filming and you need to bring the two together where you have an archaeologist filming so they know what to film and know the questions to ask. And in some respects the project leads like is a lot easier to get a grasp of on the media side because it's a smaller site, it's got fewer people to keep it the tabs on, you've got fewer features and finds coming out just yeah. because of the size so therefore it's a lot easier to document one as an archaeological record, two as a media output because you've not got so much to cover all the time, so you can be there on the trench side all the time. As we interpret a feature, we write that information down on the context sheet in the discussion bit. Um, but it's also very good to capture that on film because the person can see that all the in-depth conversations between individuals, um, the archaeology as, you know, as you go along, and then you have the interpretive process documented there and then you can understand how uh, an individual or a group have got to a particular point. Certainly, the archaeology is unpredictable. We may find nothing, we may find lots of complicated archaeology, but either way, at least with this project, it's within one or two trenches and therefore it's manageable for video documentation, whereas a more sprawling project, it's a real challenge. Definitely. Yeah.